everyone today. I am here with Josh Bowen from Kenwood. He is the mobile electronics product specialist. He does all of the trainings all over the country. And anytime I have a really weird question on a product I can't figure out, this is the man that I reach out to. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, grand introduction. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> So. We're going to do a video today about Kenwood features and just trying to get an explanation of these names that I've seen, you know, in the manuals and through the settings and I can hear what they do, but I don't necessarily understand how they're doing it. But before we jump into that, can you give us like a brief background history on the brand itself and maybe how Exelon got spawned and how long they've been in the car audio game? Yeah, no, I definitely can. So for example, a lot of people don't know, Kenwood was actually founded in 1946 by a gentleman, really? yeah, by a gentleman named Bill Kasuga. Uh, so when we first got started, we were Kasuga Radio Company Limited. And then as time went on, we ended up changing the name a little bit. We later became known as Kenwood Trio, for example. A lot of people are very familiar with that for like home audio products. But then in 1963, we opened up our first office in Long Beach, which is where we still are today. And then we became known as Kenwood. Uh, and after that is whenever we started really developing a lot of really cool products, you know, for car audio specifically uh, and following into the big boom into the, the 90s and the early 2000s. You know, we had a ton of fun along the way. There's a lot of really cool things we did. Like, for example, we once took uh, charcoal. Uh, it's actually it's called Benchotan charcoal that's made out of old oak. And we use that to create speaker cones that were going to really? be. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the goal behind it was like Bencho Tan charcoal was known for being like a very strong substance. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to try to use that, but also lightweight. So they wanted to try to use that to make a speaker cone that would be a little more durable than what some of the products were at the time. Uh, so, it, you know, it was a bunch of cool stuff that we got to do like that. Even like speaker pods, for example, that went on the rear deck of cars that also served as almost like blinkers for the back because you could tie them into your OEM system. So they would have brake lights that would pop up with the Kenwood logo on them. Oh, and wow. Yeah, there's a lot of cool things we've done throughout the course of time. But uh, the history behind it is a really cool history. It's just there's a lot that you can digest and get into. Uh, but it, it's it's also exciting to read about, at least for me. I'm one of those guys who likes digging into things like that. So when did the Exelon part like become a thing? <sighs> so Exelon came a little bit later down the road. I don't know the exact year behind it. But throughout like the, the phase of Kenwood, we knew that we wanted to have some products to kind of help stand out a little bit more, you know, um, and a lot of brands have done stuff like that. You know, for example, JVC had their Arsenal line back in the day, too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was just kind of a, a, a thing that a lot of people saw value in was seeing a product that was a little bit higher tier uh, and you got a little bit better features out of it, you know, for a little bit more money. Uh, you know, car manufacturers do the same thing, for example, yeah. Toyota and Lexus, right? Honda and Acura. Um, Exelon reference though, is actually something that we're really proud of because that is something that we pushed for here in America. We wanted the XR line. We wanted to have a line for our dealers that was just that extra little bit better. Um, so that was something that actually Scott, uh, Caswell, who works here at Kenwood, uh, and a few other people got together to birth that, uh, I want to say about five, 10 years ago within that time frame. So that one's actually the newest of all of them. Um, but you know, our excellent reference models are the models that have like the 1280 by 720 resolution screens right. and things like that. So, um, small little things to help distinguish them and, and bring them out, but also things that are valuable to the people who are looking for those features at the same time. Definitely higher quality components that are in, it's an audible difference. Right. Really. Yeah, no, it is. We do. I mean, like audio file grade components on the boards and everything internally on the Exelon or the Exelon reference models. Uh, four volt to five volt pre out. So there's a lot of things like that that we've done to kind of differentiate them. Even like the X chassis, for example, is an, a chassis that you get on the Exelon and Exelon reference models that's designed to be more durable and to make sure that the product lasts a little bit longer. So it's not even necessarily the audio quality, but also the longevity of the product. Build quality too. Yep, exactly. Very cool. Yep. One of those features that Kenwood's always done that I love, but I don't really understand what it's doing is Supreme. I found yeah. like an old manual that defines Supreme as technology to extrapolate and supplement with proprietary algorithm, the high frequency <laughs> range that is cut off when encoding. Yeah. 
So in English. <laughs> so here, here's what Supreme is. Um, think about it like this. Whenever audio is recorded, usually it's compressed, right? A lot of audio that we listen to. Now, these days, it's not as common, right? As we start to see things like Spotify and other apps that are offering like a higher resolution that you can yeah. have or listening service that you can pay for. But originally, a lot of MP3 files, for example, were known for being very compressed. And when that happens, you lose a lot of that audio data. So a lot of those frequency ranges are lost along the way. So the goal behind Supreme was and is still to this day to help restore some of that data that's been lost, primarily in the higher frequencies. Uh, so let's say that, for example, you've got, uh, I don't know if anybody's a Rush fan, Neil Peart was the drummer for them that was well known for using a lot of parts of the drum set. So like chimes, cymbal crashes, things like that. They're usually in those higher frequency ranges. In a compressed track, you're going to lose some of that audio quality or some of that information whenever the receiver's playing that back. When you enable Supreme, it brings that information back to life. So it works by decompressing what's compressed to give you back that information and just help that listening experience to be a little bit better. A couple of years back, we actually revamped it a little bit more too. So nowadays on like new receivers, whenever you enable Supreme, uh, not only are you adding back some of that lost data, but you're also applying a small tune to the EQ, which is done inside of the DSP to kind of brighten those frequency ranges that were decompressed through, throughout that Supreme process. That's really interesting because from a listening standpoint, it to me personally, it just tends to smooth things out. Yeah. And I'm not even usually using compressed music, but, you know, even on, you know, like Apple music or something that's sure. lossless. It yeah. definitely smooths it out. Yeah, no, and that's the goal behind it. It's not something that it's kind of one of those. Uh, what is the expression? The beauty is in the details, uh, for yeah. example. Like, um, it's not one of those things that when you turn it on, it's like it smacks you in the face and you immediately notice it. But it's one of those things that's just designed to be kind of subtle, but an improved listening experience along the way. Awesome. Yeah, very cool. Thanks so much for explaining that. Of course. Um, and the other thing I really wanted to know is when we select features like space enhancer or speaker size. Mm -hmm. What kind of processing is going on with that? Or is there any time alignment that's happening? Or like so, when you do cabin size? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. Um, it's a little bit in the EQ and it's a little bit in the time alignment at the same time. Uh, so, so let's say for example, if we go to the speaker size, you know, like mm -hmm. a six and a half inch speaker is gonna play lower frequencies than a four inch speaker, right? So whenever you select that speaker, you're not going to see it reflected in any of the settings, but internally in the DSP, it's going to make those adjustments based off of typical ranges for that speaker size. So what okay. it'll do is it'll kind of broaden those frequency ranges with like a six and a half, maybe it'll boost up just a little bit on the 80 Hertz and up, you know, between that range. Whereas on like a four inch, it's not going to put 80 Hertz through that speaker as much as it would through a six and a half. So um, they all work kind of with a common goal in mind of that same thing as like space enhancer. Um, that's going to be more on the time alignment side. So the goal behind that is to enhance the space obviously, but let's say for example, you have like a, a larger SUV, you know, the interior cabin of that is much larger than it would be if you were in like a Honda civic. Mm -hmm. So when you enable that space enhancer, that is designed to kind of help fill that space a little bit better. Uh, through different types of time alignment, depending on, you know, how large the vehicle is. So it's kind of predetermined values that we've put together that are uploaded into that receiver that are enabled once you change those settings in those ways. So it's like an easy way for a consumer to set crossover points in time alignment, basically just plug right. it in the speaker size and the cabin size. Yeah, exactly. And that's okay. exactly what it is. It's, it's all, and it all works together, similar to how even on our time alignment side of the receiver you know we have pre-settings that you can do like front front left front right you know yep. rear all that so um they all kind of work together in the time alignment and in the tuning to be able to really make it easy user friendly i guess you could say yeah i like that yeah that's the goal cool cool <laughs> um there's one feature though that i feel like is not properly named and that's okay. loudness i have so yeah. many customers that think that, oh, you turn loudness on when you're listening to it loud. And, you know, I try to explain to them, no, it's kind of a misnomer. And I feel like a lot of people 
will distort their speakers or damage their speakers, not really understanding. What, why do they put that in there? So loudness why and don't bass they rename is, it? right. Renaming it would probably be a better thing. I think really it boils down to the fact that loudness has just been what it's been called since it's been around, you know, I mean, so the people who already are looking for that feature, they're looking for loudness. Um, but loudness and bass boost both, uh, they're, they're, they can be your best friend or your worst enemy. So like me, I actually use loudness on a pretty regular basis, but that's because I'm using it the way that it's intended. So if I'm driving along, my average listening levels, like for example, I have a small child and if my daughter's in the back seat of the truck with me, I'm not gonna have the subs blaring and all the speakers, right. you know, 35, 40 on the volume knob. But I do still want that bump and I still want those things that come at higher volumes. You know, whenever you've got that receiver turned all the way up, then the amplifier has all that information to give you that thump. But when you don't have that at lower volumes, you don't get that thump as much. So that's that's the goal behind loudness and bass boost is to be able to be utilized in that type of a manner. If you want to boost the lower frequencies uh, specifically, bass boost is great to use at a low volume, but you never want to use them at a loud level. So same thing with loudness, you know, loudness is going to apply a tune for the lower frequencies and the mid range so that you can boost that inside of the door panel kick for the mid bass and those lower frequencies at the same time. But it is that one thing that if you could, you know, spend maybe five minutes extra talking, I always told my, my guys at, at the shop I worked at, if you can spend five extra minutes, just explain to them that loudness can be your best friend or your worst enemy. It's great to use in the great and in, in the ideal environment but it's also going to kill your speakers if you got your receiver bumped up all the way and you enable that. So do you know what like would be a safe listening volume? Like if you didn't have an amp or anything on, on a Kenwood deck for, for using those features, like before that I haven't measured, so I don't know when it might distort. Not, not offhand um, primarily. And obviously it's going to change depending on the source and the quality of the audio coming into it at the same time. Typically, like in my personal experience in my truck, for example, uh, I won't use it if I'm above 20. Like just I will not do that because that's whenever the, the amplifier really starts to pick up higher voltage once we start moving above that. So lower listening levels, I, I, my average listening level on my receiver, it goes up to 40. When I've got people in the car with me, I'm around 15, right. uh, you know, just for some background noise. And in those cases, around 15 to 20, that's where I'll find myself using those features. Yep. But once I get above that 20 point, uh, I, I disable them because, you know, I know I'm going to crank it up a little bit more and I, I like my system to last. So <laughs> that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, very well. There's another uh, funky feature in, I think it's in the EQ settings called base extension mm -hmm. in layman's terms. Can you explain what that's actually doing? So the goal behind base extension is to kind of smooth out the lower frequency levels. So Imagine it like um, you've got a rock song and maybe it's peaking at like 60 hertz for the kick and the drum. When you enable bass extension, the goal behind that is to help it sound more of like a smoother sound by boosting the surrounding frequencies a little bit to match what's playing at that time. So it, it's, again, one of those things kind of like Supreme. You may not notice it immediately, but it's just overall better listening experience whenever you enable that feature. Is that kind of like Q factor where it's just kind of widening what? what yeah. Band? So basically okay. basic extension will kind of widen the Q. I didn't know how far we wanted to get in that, but yeah. Okay. So basically, <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll just kind of widen that Q a little bit more. So uh, whenever you're doing things like loudness, for example, you're going to make that Q a little more narrow, the more, the higher that loudness is enabled. So a lot of those different frequencies will, or settings, I'm sorry, will change the Q of that tune, depending on how high that output is expected to be. So, but yes, yeah, yeah. basic oh, cool. tension, smoother bass is the goal behind it. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. I really appreciate you coming out or not really coming out, but meeting with me in my yeah. first Zoom meeting. <laughs> Hopping <laughs> to my desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have another follow-up question. I, this is a really common question I get from clients. What's the best way for them to get notified about software updates? Software updates? Uh, that's actually a great question. And we recently implemented something for all of our dealers and specifically uh, to help them find kind of a common hub for where all this information is. But what we've done is we've actually created a dealer email blast. So for all of our dealers, but then also a consumer email blast. And we send that out uh, to all of our consumers anytime there is a change. 
And at the bottom of that email blast, there's always the most recent software updates. So for any receiver that has, you know, an update that's coming up soon or an update that just went live, that'll be listed down in the bottom of that email blast. And that's probably the best way to be able to subscribe to that. And then you get that email blast once a month and you can keep an eye on it. There is obviously the route of going to our website and checking, but you know, I personally like things to be reminded. So for me, if I can get that email, that helps save me a bunch of time along the way too. That's super helpful. So Josh, thank you so much for taking the time. I know we've been talking about doing this for a really long time. I think since last summer, we first talked. Yeah, and it's been it's been a while, a long time in the making. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be more because uh, I'm, I'm sure I have a lot more interesting questions. And yes, if we can do something again together in the future, that would be great. Oh, I'm absolutely looking forward to it. Like I told you earlier, when we first talked about it, the questions uh, make my mind wonder, too. So it's good to be challenged and uh, in the best ways, not in a, in a bad way or negative way. But I enjoy it. So I'm looking forward to it on my, on my end, too. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. You have a great weekend. You're welcome. Take care, Annie. Bye.